Hi everyone and welcome to my Advanced Clinical Procedures Periodontal Assessment Project by Angelica Yamas. My patient's name is Joseph King. He is a 42-year-old African-American male. Uh, he was in a recent car accident which led him to have a C7 spinal cord injury and he had a history of prior seizures. Uh, he's currently unemployed due to the accident and he's married with two kids. Unfortunately, he lacks the motivation to improve his oral condition. My patient suffers from complex seizures in which he loses uh, conscience and he will not remember what happened. For this, he takes phenytoin sodium. He takes 100 milligrams by mouth three times a day. The only special considerations for this medication is that it can cause multi-organ hypersensitivity, abrupt withdrawal, and may precipitate status epilepticus. Any contraindications of the medication would be if the patient is hypersensitive to phenytoin or other hydatoins. Oral effects of this medication include gingival hyperplasia and serostomia. For his spinal cord injury, he takes dantrolene, which is dantrium. He takes 50 milligrams by mouth three times a day. The only special consideration for this drug is that he must follow the tritation regimen very strictly. He must avoid any alcohol and frequent sun exposure. Any contraindications include the, an active hepatic disease, such as hepatitis and cirrhosis. Oral effects are none. However, there can be some allergic reactions that cause swelling and itching of the tongue and throat. As you can see on his periodontal assessment, he has generalized bleeding on most of his teeth. Um, there are a couple of mobility areas as well as frication areas. The bleeding occurs on most of the teeth and their probing depths are well over four millimeters. There are some pocket depths on teeth number 30 and 31 that include pockets of eight, nine, and 10 millimeters. There's also localized recession on teeth number 22 and 23 from 1 to 2 millimeters. There's also mobility on teeth number 2, 3, 14, 15, 18, 19, 30, and 31. There are class 2 frications on teeth number 3, 14, and 15. There are class 3 frications on teeth number 2, 18, 30, and 31. And there is a clinical class 4 vacation on tooth number 19. As you can see on the probing depths, even in the anterior, the probing readings are very high. For AAP periodontal classification, I chose 1A plaque induced and 1B non plaque induced gingival disease. I chose these two because plaque induced would relate to his spinal cord injury in which he has limited ability to remove any plaque from his teeth and non-plaque induced based on his epileptic condition. Uh, the extent of periodontitis is generalized, which is also chronic, and it's severe, which is well over five millimeters of clinical attachment loss. There is also a systemic and autoimmune parasystemic disease which is caused by the epilepsy. There is a periodontal condition in which there is a multilocular lesion from tooth number 23 and number 26 in the radiographs. ADA periodontal case type. My patient presents with class four severe periodontitis, which is generalized. As you could tell on the Periodontal assessment, there were probing readings of 7 millimeters and above. There was generalized bleeding and localized recession in some areas. There were frications of class 2 and class 3, as well as one class 4 frication, which was clinically visible. There were four areas of grade 2 mobility. In the radiographs, you will be able to see that there is horizontal bone loss as well as vertical bone loss and alveolar bone loss of five millimeters below the CEJ or more. There's also five millimeters 
loss of clinical attachment. There is frications that are visible in the radiographs as well as clinically, and there is a poor crown to root ratio of 2 to 1. My ADA periodontal case type reads as follows. Patient presents with generalized bleeding and inflammation over 30% associated with plaque-induced gingivitis due to systemic disease issues. There are advanced signs of gingival attachment and alveolar bone loss over 5 millimeters throughout the dentition. There is also grade 2 mobility present in all molars. Radiographic findings support evidence of a 2 to 1 crown to tooth ratio and bone level changes of 6 to 7 millimeters below CEJ. There are class 2 frications in teeth number 3, 14, 15, and class three on number two, 18, 30, and 31. There is also a clinical class four frication on tooth number 19. Changeable description. Because my patient suffers from class four severe periodontitis, the location and the severity will stay the same as well as the di distribution. The location will be generalized for all areas, including color, contour, consistency, and texture. Distribution will range in all areas from the free gingiva to the diffused. And depending on the location, we'll stop at the papillary or attached. The severity will stay the same, like I said, at severe. For color, there is chronic dark red and cyanotic areas, which is generalized. There is also melanin pigmentation, but that is normal. There are localized areas of blanching, which is due to the dilatin. For contour, the margins are rounded and there is localized receding margins in the mandibular, canine, and lateral. The papilla is cratered in most areas, but as well bulbous, which is generalized and is due to the Dilatin. The consistency is soft and spongy, and it's also swollen. The texture is shiny in some areas, however, is generalized fibrotic with deep stippling. My gingival assessment statement reads as follows Gingival color appears generalized dark red and cyanotic from free gingiva to diffused, with moderate areas of blanching. Gingival contour presents as generalized severely bulbous papilla with rounded and cratered margins. There is also localized areas of recession in the mandibular arch. Gingival consistency is severely swollen and is generalized soft and spongy. Gingival surface texture presents as severely fibrotic with deep stippling, which is generalized throughout the dentition with localized areas of a, surf a shiny surface texture appearance. Assessment statements. In this slide, you will be able to correlate all the classifications, case types, and gingival descriptions. Like I mentioned, my patient suffers from a spinal cord injury, the disease is epilepsy, and he suffers from ADA case type 4, severe generalized periodontitis. I have already stated the ADA case type in the gingival description. I will be reading the AAP classification. The statement states as follows. Patient presents with generalized plaque-induced periodontitis due to poor oral home care, as well as non-plaque-induced due to their current systemic disease. There is a multilocular lesion between teeth number 23 and 26 and periodontal conditions of mobility on number 2, 3, 14, 15, 18, 19, 30, and 31. There are class 2 frication on number 3, 14, and 15. There are class 3 frication on number 2, 18, 30, and 31. There is also a clinical class 4 frication on tooth number 19. In this radiographic image, you can clearly see horizontal bone loss on the anterior, maxillary, and mandibular arch. 
The vertical bone loss is present in the maxillary and mandibular arch as well, however, it is more localized to the posteriors. You can clearly see a class 4 perforation, which will be clinically visible in another image. You can also see a class 3 perforation on tooth number 30. On the same tooth, you can also see a 6 millimeter clinical attachment loss. As I stated before, there is a multilocular lesion between teeth number 23 and 26. I added another radiographic image so that you can get a better close up of the radiographic bone loss as well as rotations and clinical attachment loss. In this bite wing, you can see the class 3 frication on tooth number 30, as well as the class 2 frication on tooth number 3. On the same tooth, you can see a greater than 6 millimeters before, below the CEJ. Like I stated, there is horizontal bone loss on the anterior maxillary arch, and there was vertical bone loss closer to the posteriors of the mandibular arch. In this gingival image, you can clearly see the effects of the dilatin medication. Dilatin causes gingival hyperplasia, which is an overgrowth of the gingiva. This causes bulbous papilla as well as its shiny and tex shiny texture appearance. In the picture, you can also see that there is slight blanching from the attached gingiva to the papillary as well as the color, which is dark red or cyanotic, which is chronic. The texture is also fibrotic with deep stippling. There are also some areas that you can see calculus as well as staining and some melanin pigmentation. In this other gingival image, you can clearly see a texture that is fibrotic with deep stippling as well as cratered papilla. You can also see the effects of dilatin, which is the blanching of the papilla. Some epileptic patients experience nocturnal seizures, which causes severe bruxism and overall can cause wearing down of the enamel and tooth structures. In this other gingival image, you can clearly see the bleeding upon probing, which is severely generalized based on the periodontal assessment. Again, you can see more deep stippling and you can see this shiny texture. In this particular image, you can also see more melanin pigmentation as well as calculus deposits. Some effects of dilatin include severe serostomia which can lead to Sjorgen syndrome. Serostomia can in turn lead to decay, as we all know. In this image, you can see decay on the premolar and molar areas of the mandibular arch. You can also see the class four vacation involvement, which like I stated, was clinically visible. You can also see calculus deposits and the localized recession presented in the periodontal assessment. Like I mentioned before, an adverse effect of dilatin is severe serostomia. It has been reported that in some cases, dilatin can cause Sjogren's syndrome. In this image, you can see the oral manifestation of Sjogren's syndrome on the tongue of this patient. It has also been reported that dilatin can cause emesis, aka vomiting. In this gingival image, you can clearly see enamel erosion caused by dilatin. You can also see the blunted or cratered papilla. On the other hand, patients who suffer from epilepsy are more prone to fractures, 
in this image, you can see a possible incisal fracture due to these seizures. Dental hygiene diagnosis. Because my patient suffers from case type 4 severe periodontitis, the prognosis is poor to questionable. The rationale behind this is due to the severe bone loss and furcation involvement of class 2, 3, and 4. The patient also has poor crown to root ratio and a plus 2 mobility. Frequent periodontal maintenance appointments will be our outcome for the advanced furcation involvement. Therapeutic goals. For the short term goals, we are going to arrest bleeding and reduce inflammation to, through periodontal debridement and SRP. We also want to restore any decayed areas with composite or amalgam. We are also going to replace unsalvageable teeth with fixed prosthodontics. Now, this can also be a long term goal depending on the patient's financial stability. For the long-term goal, we are going to halt any further periodontal bone loss and pocketing through frequent three-month recall appointments. For modifiable risk factors, we have alcohol use, serostomia, which is due to the medications, diet, and oral home care. For non-modifiable risk factors, we have epilepsy, the spinal cord injury, physical impairments, and the medications that we cannot change for the condition and disease. Treatment planning. As you can see on this slide, we are going to perform multiple examinations just because of the patient's condition. If it is a new patient, we are going to perform a comprehensive initial evaluation, which includes a periodontal screening. From there, we can choose from a comprehensive periodontal evaluation, which is once a year, or a limited oral exam. For treatment, we are going to start off with a preliminary debridement to remove all the calculus that is super gingerly. From there, we will move on to SRP and then deliver antimicrobial agents such as Arrestin or Perichip. We're also going to do a gingival irrigation, which will be with Paradax. And then from there, we are going to perform periodontal maintenance on the patient for, as a three month recall. In all appointments, I do want to go ahead and provide oral hygiene instructions, especially because the patient suffers from a spinal cord injury. So we will have to modify some aids for him to use. Treatment plan flowchart. In this slide, you can see how our treatment plan is going to go. For our first appointment, since he is a new patient, we are going to provide a limited oral exam. And from there, we will do a preliminary debridement just on the supragingival calculus. For the next appointments, we will perform a more comprehensive examination. And then for the following four appointments, we are going to perform SRP, as well as deliver Peridex and perio chip or arrestin. During these scaling and root planing appointments, we are going to deliver oral hygiene instructions. From there, the patient will move on to a three month recall. And during those three month recalls, we are going to deliver antimicrobial agents again to help the pockets. We are also going to irrigate with Peridex and again, provide oral hygiene instructions on a different interdental aid. For prevention, we are going to apply topical varnish in the form of sodium, stannous, or AFP. And lastly, again, provide oral hygiene instructions. 
instrument selection. Because my patient has a case type 4 severe periodontitis, we are going to choose certain kind of instruments that can help us better remove calculus. For the Gracies, we are going to use standards, after fives, and mini fives. And for the shank rigidity, they need to be standard or rigid. The rationale behind this is that they can remove light to moderate calculus as well as fine scale. The finishing curettes will be able to go and remove fine calculus and the line angles and also provide a better adaptation to the frications and narrow pockets. For scalars, we are going to use a Nevi 1, and the shank rigidity will be a standard scalar as well. The rationale will be that scalars will be able to help us remove moderate to heavy calculus, and the Nevi is good to remove super gingival calculus on the anterior teeth. For ultrasonics, we are going to use a Paraline 1000, a Paraline 10, a, and a Paraline right and left, as well as a 10 universal. The rationale behind this is that they can remove moderate to heavy calculus, the Paraline 10 can remove moderate calculus, and the right and left is good for frication and improved adaptation in periodontally involved patients. The 10 universal is good for gross debridement. Which will, we, which will be needed in our first appointment. Home care recommendations. In this slide, I will be narrating different aids that I will recommend to the patient. For prescription dental aids, I recommend ClinPro 5000, which is a 5,000 parts per million fluoride toothpaste. I also recommend a 0.12% chlorhexidine gluconate rinse. For over-the-counter dental aids, I recommend floss, which can be waxed or unwaxed, as well as tufted. I also recommend an interdental brush, such as a proxy brush, and biotine rinse, which will help with the serostomia. For the toothbrushing technique, I recommended phones technique just because of the patient's physical impairment due to his spinal cord injury. I also recommend that the patient modify a extra soft toothbrush with a tennis ball or bicycle handle so that he can better so that he can get a better adaptation of the technique or if the patient prefers a power brush. For special instructions, I will instruct the patient to use light pressure and move the handle in small circular motions throughout the dentition. Like I stated before, I do want the patient on ClinPro 5000. I will also instruct the patient to use a pea-sized amount when applying it to the toothbrush and avoid rinsing with water afterwards. For floss, I will recommend that the patient use tufted floss or wax floss, which can be then put in a floss holder that can also be modified. I will instruct the patient to gently move the floss and floss holder through open embrasures. For interdental aids, I recommend a proxy brush with the refills and a modified holder. I will instruct the patient to gently slide in between the embrasures, especially in the posteriors, to remove any plaque. For mouth rinses, I recommended biotine because of the serostomia. However, I will instruct the patient to only use this when experiencing dry mouth. The patient will be put on a 0.12% chlorhexidine gluconate rinse. For this, the patient will use 15 millimeters and rinse for 30 seconds twice a day and avoid brushing or eating immediately after. For fluoride, I recommend that the patient use over-the-counter over anti-cavity fluoride toothpaste in conjunction with the prescription fluoride toothpaste. I recommend that they use this anti-cavity fluoride toothpaste at least once a day, if not twice or after meals. For prescription varnish, I recommend a 5% sodium fluoride. Special instructions for this include Avoid brushing and flossing for four to six hours and avoid any hot, crunchy, or sticky foods for four to six hours. 
I will also instruct this, this patient to avoid any products containing alcohol, such as Listerine. Nutritional analysis. Because my patient suffers from epilepsy, he will experience seizures, amnesia, anxiety, depression, headache, sleepiness, staring spells, or temporary paralysis after a seizure, as well as low vitamin D levels and folate deficiency. For his spinal cord injury, he will experience muscle weakness, problems with coordination, stiff muscles, muscle spasms, or overreactive reflexes. I recommend that my patient eat more dark leafy greens and increase in fiber to help with the muscle contractions. Like always, I recommend that my patient increase their water to help with the serostomia and increase their whole grain food intake, as well as their protein. I also recommend that my patient drink low fat and non-fat dairy milk. I want the patient to remove high sodium containing foods, alcohol, excess sugar, artificial sweeteners, as these could precipitate a seizure, as well as make the muscles contract. I also recommend that the patient remove grapefruit and pomegranate juice or avoid it at all costs, as these can increase the side effects of dilatin. For both conditions, the patient should remove trans fat containing foods. Since my patient has a vitamin D and a folate acid deficiency, I recommend that my patient take 25 micrograms a day of vitamin D and 400 micrograms a day of folic acid to supplement for the deficiency. It has been shown that curcumin, a derivative of turmeric, can improve neural function in a spinal cord injury. So I recommend that my patient take at least 30 milligrams a day of this supplement. Omega-3 has been shown to reduce the effects or the um, frequency of seizures. So I recommend that my patient take omega-3 fatty acids 